So, uh, I really look forward to this speech because um, this is something that I think is very uh, it's exciting and it's uh, important. So, this is Natalie Berentzina and you are from the CEO of Norbyte. Yeah. You can tell us more about your company, of course. And you are going to talk about the un underexplored potential of insects to transform plastics and polymers into proteins. This is exciting. Uh, welcome to the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the potential of the insects in turning waste into sustainable goods. So, uh, the uh, presentation will be around different points and, uh, first of all, some uh, reminders about the controversial history between humans and insects. We are used to talk about the yolk effect uh, concerning the con consumption of, of insects. Why is it so important? Why is it more important than what used to be uh, around sushis that we are, uh, often uh, uh <coughs> see as an example? Then we'll be talking about the potential of insects in circular economy, the remaining challenges, and a short outlook out of it. So, in our Western history, insects are kind of uh, having supernatural power, and more often they kind of negative uh, supernatural power. Uh, it's one of the great plague of Egypt, of ancient Egypt. And when we see here how it looks like, when we uh, um, actually uh, the, the, the sun is uh, shouted by this uh, lots of uh, insects and uh, you need also imagine the sound of it because it's kind of uh, <coughs> very loud stuff uh, and the devastation which is caused by them after all you, you can understand why uh, people consider it as a sign of of god and uh, another point uh, is uh, um, also associated with devil. So one of the names of devil is Belzebut, and actually it means master of flies. And why is that? Because flies are scavenging animals. So they are always here when uh, we are feeling badly, or animals that we are liking are feeling badly. So it's also kind of supernatural power of the insects. And <coughs> finally also, even in our everyday lives, insects are associated with bites, hygienic issues, transfer of disease, and so on. So clearly we have this, uh, I would say, subconscious um, hindrance of uh, considering insects as something good. But at the same time, we also have some, I would say, good experiences with the insects. For example, they are harvesting honey for uh, thousands of years. The first images of that were found in uh, ancient e e Egypt again. And at the same time, the silkworm, the uh, Bombyx mori, is also used for more than 3,000 years now. More recently, we have been using insects in biocontrol. So you may uh, recognize here the larvae of a ladybug, maybe less common, it's here the larvae of a uh, laceworm. It's how it looks like when it's um, uh, an adult, and those uh, larvae actually help us to fight the aphids. Maybe less commonly known, this very small wasp of or only a few millimeters called Strichoderma, and it's uh, an, a, a very nice friend of farmers who are cultivating uh, fruits and vegetables, because they are actually uh, sorry, they are actually laying eggs here in the eggs of insects were way bigger than they are, and when the larvae are just hatching within the egg, uh, destroying the whole content of it and going out of it. So actually, it's an extremely nice way to protect your uh, fruits from other uh, usable uh, insects. <coughs> and now, what about the potential of insects in the waste treating industry? So it's how to turn what we used to be afraid of into something that we can use for our benefits. And for example, looking again into those scavenging insects, actually it's extremely interesting because it means that this garbage actually can be reused. And here you have 
some picture of utilization of black soldier fly, some other garbage can be ha uh, handled by house flies and some other individuals. At Norbite, we have selected another insect, here, the wax moth. And actually, this specific insect is able to digest different kinds of uh, plastic and polymeric materials. We can see here, for example, this yellowish foamish part, which is a unrecyclable part of our mattresses, cushions, things like that. You can see here a multi-layer polypropylene, different types of fibers, mixture of synthetic and uh, artificial and uh, natural fibers. So clearly it can treat more than 90% of commonly used plastic and polymeric materials and we are specifically targeting the unrecyclable, unsorted, end-of-life plastic and polymeric materials. Some people can go even um, further on with, for example, scatological insects, dung beetle. I didn't see yet any company working on that, but I'm sure <laughs> it will be common in future. So what about uh, this stuff, that uh, whatever the organic waste you have, whatever the organic uh, waste material you possess, there is at least one or even several insects that are capable to digest it. So why is it so? Why insects are so efficient in this type of things? But when you are looking into the um, uh, animal uh, ecology, how they are living, so actually, we are always fighting for, for food substrates. And it's uh, very important to, to be the strongest, the smartest, with whatever it is. But insects, they are kind of tiny compared to other animals. So they cannot fight that much against big animals. So what we need, we need to find specific ecological niche where eating something that no one else is interested in. So that's why they are so nice in consuming different types of waste. And when they have adapted themselves to that, it's kind of symbiosis, which is the um, combination of microbiological ecosystem within the gut of the insects and their specific insects' enzymes, which make it that efficient. So actually, when we are looking now for treating different types of waste, we started within the industrial biotechnology working with microorganisms. But one specific microorganism for this type of waste, one another for that type of waste, when we tried to mix those microorganisms together to treat a mixture. But actually, within the insect's gut, this mixture is already existing and it's already living all together. So it's fantastically interesting bioreactor with those specific ads that are the uh, insect's inner enzymes. So concerning the substrate, but uh, concerning the uh, um, substrate, so we can see that there are different types of waste that can be transformed. And when it's interesting to see what is becoming of that. So what are the products that are coming out of it? And when uh, we're talking about products, we're actually talking about a biorefinery. And let's remind us what is a biorefinery. A refinery itself, it's actually a separation of different ingredients of a mixture. So actually, for the insects, we can define three types of uh, refining levels. The first refining level, is the one we are most speaking about, is uh, concerning major primary metabolites, proteins, lipids, and frass. Then it's, it, there is a second refining level concerning minor primary metabolites, which are chitin, which we are transforming to chitosan. And then there is a third refining level concerning secondary metabolites. So going fast into this <coughs> first refining level, so for proteins. For example, here you have a study that was made with uh, some mealworm uh, powder, and you see the inclusion of this powder to the feed of uh, juvenile uh, fish. So the darker the color, the uh, most of inclusion is important. So the uh, clear one is a traditional uh, diet. So you see that actually more you have insects inside, the quicker the fish is growing. But the very interesting point is here. When you are comparing after 60 days how the fish has grown with insect meal and after 90 days how it has grown without, with its traditional diet. And you see that the level is the same. So knowing that uh, at that point with traditional diet, it's the commercial way of uh, the specific uh, fish, 
you see that actually we are shortening this cycle by 30 days. We are shortening the cycle by one month. So when we need to use three months to get a fish to their commercial value, now we need only two months. And if you are counting in, in years, so you see that when in one, uh, in one year you had four generations, now you have six generations of fish within one single year. It's extremely important enhancement here. When we are looking into the lipids, so we can compare insect lipids with uh, actually uh, different other types of, um, of oils. And when you are looking, for example, for mealworm, you can see that at some point it's very similar to the olive oil, actually. So it has a little bit less of uh, unsaturated fatty acid, but it has way more poorly unsaturated fatty acids. So actually when we are saying that, I would say we are saying everything. So there are lots of many different types of utilization of insect uh, oil, which are coming from food to cosmetics to biodiesel or whatever, feed, etc. Uh, concerning frass, so yeah, it's used as a uh, biofertilizer and it enhances both the uh, roots and also the uh, vegetation because of the combination of uh, different uh, uh, substrates within this uh, frass. Concerning the second refining level, so it's chitin, it's what is coming from the exoskeleton of arthropods and it's uh, transformed to, to chitosan through the deacetylation and when it becomes a very interesting compound which is used to uh, heal wounds. So it uh, has different positive effects in wound healing. But let's talk a little bit about the third refining level. Uh, <coughs> what about those uh, secondary metabolites? What can we get out of them? It's actually fascinating what we can get out of them. Uh, first compounds I would like to talk to you about are uh, um, antimicrobial peptides, AMPs. It's very interesting that they have been discovered by uh, Alexander Fleming uh, actually a hundred years ago. And he discovered those antimicrobial peptides prior to uh, discovering penicillin. But uh, penicillin being uh, extremely effective, and when we know that there has been an era of um, uh, antibiotics. But uh, very early we have seen also this resistance uh, to, uh, of microorganisms, of pathogens to uh, um, antibiotics. And this multidrug resistance draw us to see for some other solutions how to heal, how to overcome this difficulty of uh, multidrug uh, resistance of uh, microorganisms. And we looked back to the antimicrobial peptides. And there are several that have been found within the uh, insects. So let's uh, go to the, yeah, maybe skip a little bit of technicalities here, going to the mechanism of action of antimicrobial peptides. Because this is an extremely interesting and important point. The main difference between the antibiotics and antimicrobial peptides is the mechanism of action. Antibiotics, there are small molecules that are working like the uh, Emil Fischer's key and lock. So you have the key, you have the lock, and it works perfectly well. So when the key is entering the lock, so then the pathogen cannot uh, do what it's supposed to do, and it collapses. But with this very uh, high specificity of this system, key and lock, makes it also very simple to overcome. Because <coughs> you can have only one thing which is changing, and the key is no longer entering. So it's how you create resistance. When we are looking to the mode of action of uh, antimicrobial peptides, it's completely different. With the big molecules, they are not entering actually the cell of the pathogen, but they are placing themselves uh, uh, outside of it. And uh, they are kind of drilling holes within the membrane of the pathogen, and then the pathogen just emptied uh, itself slowly. So the, the, the point is, when, when you need to, to drill something, you need several points of attachment, 
but none of them is very strong attachment. So even if you are losing one or two points, it doesn't matter. You still have been drilling. So that's why those uh, antimicrobial peptides are considering that they are not creating uh, significant resistance within the pathogens, and they are classified in, on priority list of World uh, Health Organization. <coughs> Sorry. So for the moment, they're uh, really underexplored uh, in terms of uh, medical applications. The only one I could find was that one, when you know when you have some uh, dead tissues and nothing else is working. So they are introducing some uh, fly larvae in the wound, and we're letting them to uh, make um, the work during two weeks. And uh, the larvae are actually eating uh, um, scavenged tissues and also placing antimicrobial peptides all around the wound so the pathogen cannot um, come again there. And it's, it's working, but it's not a very nice nicely accepted, I would say, therapy, so that's why it's only used in the uh, very last possibilities. So looking for some other therapeutic activities that uh, have been found in the insect, you can see there are many of them. The, an interesting point is that uh, we are looking into the species that have been found the most uh, uh, abundant in different therapeutic uh, molecules. Actually, those are species of the insects that are living close to humans. And this is normal because all, all, most of this information is coming from traditional medicines, not from pharmaceutical labs, but from what has been learned from centuries. And it's uh, also something that we can see when we are looking into the found activities. But the activities that have been found are also the activities that uh, humans were mostly looking into that are something which is, uh, can be immediately healed, like antibiotics or things like that. And on the contrary, something which is of long-term of healing, like liver disease, intestine disease, we, have see, we see less um, molecules here that have been identified. And uh, that's why one of the peculiar facts is that, uh, for example, there are many insects that um, presumably have aphrodisiac effect, and again, it's just because people were looking into it, which means that this table is completely subjective. It's not based on the flow of research of different types of activities, but uh, it's based on uh, the study of the insects that were around humans and on what humans were looking into. So it's a really a huge potential behind this, this table, which needs to be uh, discovered. Uh, for some other uh, activities, what is very interesting, as we said, that the insects were actually very rarely attacking bigger animals in this <coughs> natural life. So their best enemies are other insects. So when we are fighting against insects because they can be best for us, actually the best way to do it is looking into other insects because they are having repellent substances for each other. Sometimes they're also uh, ha uh, working as a storage from uh, different substances that they're consuming from their natural substrates. And sometimes uh, some other animals are uh, used as storage of some specifically uh, active uh, compounds, like here, batracotoxin, which is actually a, a name which uh, supposed that the toxin is coming from, uh, from a frog, but actually it comes from the insect that the frog is consuming. There are also some interesting symbioses or even um, parasites uh, way between insects and fungus. Uh, like here, when uh, Cordyceps fungus actually uh, spelling his uh, germs into the uh, larvae of the insect and then freeing out and producing this very interesting con compound which is called cordycepin and it has lots of uh, different potential um, interest for, for humans. And uh, not to forget about carminic acid which is used now for decades as a, <coughs> a colorant for, for food. Yeah, so all this looks very nice. 
but what are the remaining challenges from br bringing all this through all this natural um, uh, richness of molecules of potential into the uh, uh, our, our uh, everyday life into the uh, industrial realization and um, uh, the unusual stuff, I would like to start with the challenge of technology. Uh, and why is it important? Because production of biomass, the biotechnological production, it's not something new for humans. We used to do it, for example, with production of beer or of wine. And it works very nicely for centuries. But if we look at, uh, into it as, uh, from the uh, industrial biotechnology perspective, what all those systems have in common is that they have this liquid stuff within uh, a reactor and where the whole fermentation is taking place. And it's very nice, we can control lots of things by taking small aliquots, which are representative of the whole container of the uh, liquid jar, and an analyze it. And all this is possible because of the homogeneity of this liquid phase uh, fermentation. But humans have also worked with some other stuff. Like here, the production of soya sauce, compost, and I couldn't avoid to put some nice French cheese. So <laughs> the point here is that we are working with solid state fermentation. Solid state fermentation, you have much less consensus, you have much less uh, universal uh, jar how to, uh, to produce it. You have different types of uh, adaptations made, whether you are mixing or not uh, your biomass, whether you are forcing aeration or not into your biomass. And uh, you don't have uh, the, the, the possibility to take a representative uh, sample of it, uh, because the whole system is very complicated, and you have what we are called a gradient of temperature, the gradient of production of um, <coughs> molecules and so on. So that's why in traditional, I would say, um, industrial biotechnology, when we see heterogeneity, we are saying just avoid it <laughs> and use it only if otherwise it's impossible. But when we are looking into insects, we can no longer use an homogeneous system. We need to use something which is of heterogeneous system. And how it works. So here, for example, you have some picture of artisanal production of insects. And here, one of the first um, industrial production. The main thing here is we have replaced human by robots. It's, I would say, the first generation of uh, industrial insect production. And when we have replaced humans by robots, we have solved a few issues. You see that here we call them are way higher. But we also have created some arms, because here you have lots of space between different trays, and here you don't. So the whole first generation technology of uh, insect production was around this type of uh, question about trays and ultimately about ventilation. You can see here very huge tubings due to ventilation. And all this conducted to high energy consumption and actually some difficulties in scaling up. So when we look into uh, the global, uh, let's say, context, uh, all main actors currently uh, are pre pro proposing this type of solutions which are corresponding to this one, which is with uh, no mixing and no um, forced uh, aeration. But as we have seen, there's many other possibilities to uh, do some uh, solid-state uh, biomass production. And with the second generation of insect producing systems, we have seen some new uh, uh, technologies emerging. For example, rotating drone, which is proposed by Enterprote, it's a uh, uh, Finnish company, and it is adapted to a black soldier fly. Uh, Steered drone is something which is proposed by a Dutch company called Amuscam. And <coughs> here you have a very interesting system because it's all packed within a container. So it's the, the, the bottom line here is container. So which means that it's kind of easy to transport. And we are gaining again with this vertical uh, superposition possible of uh, containers. 
When we have also the system with forced aeration, so mainly the fluidized bed, bed here, it was about to be developed by a company called Imago Engineering, which is based in Russia, and I don't have any more news due to recent events. But even coming back to this first system with uh, no mixing and uh, no forced aeration, there could be some innovation made out of it. For example, here you have a Dutch company called Vinsect, which is not using trays any longer, which is using conveyors. And here you have a whole conveyor of uh, mealworms, actually. And this conveyor is advancing and the, uh, with the age of the, uh, of the insects. So in, in the beginning, you have just uh, hatched eggs, and at the end, you have commercial-sized larvae. And here again, you see that you no longer have any specific ventilation issues, which is rather interesting, because we are solving some of the technological problems here. At Norobite, we are also working with uh, technological solutions that we uh, have patented, that we know that is resilient, and we have estimated to be cost-effective uh, for different types of uh, insect uh, breeding systems. But when we are talking about remaining challenges, we can avoid talk uh, about legislation. And why is it important? Because current legislation favors linear economy, and it is based on the origin of the product, which is kind of uh, something that we find even more, I would say, within the food industry than within some other type of industry, industries, because we have kind of labels saying that it's of controlled origin. When you are buying a mustard of Dijon, it's uh, very important that it's from Dijon, even if you could uh, make the same recipe here in Stockholm. So it's something which is extremely important uh, to, uh, to change this, uh, this paradigm, to, to, to change this way of thinking that what is important is not where it was produced or from what, but what is the ultimate quality of the product. The main reason for this legislation is safety, of course, and we need to, to, to understand it and to, to be um, cer certain that we are addressing this concern, this legitimate concern, of the uh, legislation body. But <coughs> some studies have shown, actually, that black soldier fly is able to detoxify the prion agent from the meat that uh, has been con contaminated. And uh, here we need to, to think about again about these natural cyclic systems, where in, in nature you have no waste. Why? Because any leaf turbers is reused by another species. And when it's reused, it's not Mm -mm. It, it, it meant to be safe. So actually, when we are using a natural solution for treating waste, we have more chance for it to be safe, because it was meant for it. It's something very important that, need to that we need to stress out. So for the next steps, we, also, we really need to <coughs> stress this point. For the, if we want to go to the circular economy, we need this paradigm chain for circular by design. We need to combine efforts with other actors of circular economy. And the utilization of waste is really what makes this insect industry very special, very unique in this sustainable context. So just a few words saying that this uh, insect possess this huge and underexplored potential for the circular economy and that there are some systemic change and inventive entities that are mandatory to uh, realize this whole potential and become it an industrial reality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to hurry in the end. Uh, we don't have time for questions right now, and I'm sure that they have a lot of questions, so maybe they can talk to you at lunch? Of course. Of yes, of course. And this is the honey for you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you.